morning, everyone, and thanks for coming to the talk. So let's begin with a, a little prayer, and we'll, we'll go from there. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. O Lord, who enlightens the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that in the same Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever enjoy his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, help of Christians, pray, pray for us. Saint Paul of the Cross, pray, pray for us. And Saint John de Brebeuf and Isaac Yogues, pray, pray for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You're probably wondering who on earth are these two saints. They're the saints that are offered for us in the Church Universal for veneration today. Uh, John de Brebeuf and Isaac Yogues are the North American martyrs and had a horrible martyrdom, but anyway, the martyrs usually do. And then Paul of the Cross was a priest who was incredibly dedicated to uh, following Christ through the mystery of his cross, and so we honor him today. But the topic for today's talk is the theological virtues. Again, this is a potentially a talk that can go for three weeks, but we'll see how it goes. I'm trying to cover the theological virtue of faith and then of hope, and then of love in one go. If we manage it, well and good. If not, we'll continue over to next week. So very often when we say, you know, we follow Christ through faith, we see this testified very deeply in the scriptures. We see it not only in the gospels, but we see it testified to or demonstrated very much in the letters of St. Paul, but also the other letters as well. We often talk about faith, you know, I follow God through faith, I see Christ through faith, I trust in God. And we think that faith is, we use the term as incorporating everything about the life of God. And this is a risk because we can fall into the trap of thinking that it's, it's faith alone. But in fact, this was never the thinking in the early church, nor in the Middle Ages, nor at any time. In fact, the church very clearly distinguished between three virtues, which are a power and ability, virtus, it comes from the Latin word, and vir is a word for man, so it's manly qualities, even though they can be carried by men and women, so no, no exclusion there. Uh, but it's, uh, the idea is that the, the power is there in the human heart to be able to do certain things. Now. The virtues that help us to actually know God in himself is not just one, the virtue of faith, but in fact three, faith, hope, and love. And each one of them is designed and given by God to perfect us as human beings and enable us to know him in himself. So the theological virtues are called theological because they actually are founded on God himself. Only the Holy Spirit can actually increase them within us. And they grow within us indirectly. Whereas all the other virtues, the moral virtues, we have the virtues of prudence, say, or justice, fortitude, or temperance. And these are virtues that are known as moral virtues, but also because they are, they carry within them a whole lot of other virtues, like, uh, I don't know, let's say the virtue of temperance carries with it the virtue of sobriety, control with food and drink, chastity, ordering of our sexuality, the uh, temperance of our anger, our passion. All of that come under the cardinal virtue of temperance. So because they actually govern a whole lot of other virtues, they're called cardinals. Because cardinals, you know, are the big shots, sort of uh, the college of cardinals. So that's where it comes from. So we've got four cardinal moral virtues, but then there's also what we call the infused virtue there, infused moral virtues. And these all come to us through our baptism. But there is the moral virtue on a human level, on the level of prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance, which we grow in by practicing. And the more we practice, the more perfect we grow in that area. 
So if we practice making prudential judgments or prudent judgments, it means good decisions in relation to the things of God, we grow in prudence. And eventually, not after a few months, but after several years, our judgment is better formed and we become a person of good judgment, which is necessary to ultimately become a wise person. But, so there's a natural basis to all of these. But when we come to the theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, there isn't actually a natural basis to faith, hope, and love, because they're virtues that enable us to know God in himself. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking, but don't we also have a natural parallel to the virtue of faith? that we might actually call a natural faith? And the answer is yes. You all exercised natural faith this morning, in me actually. I know that's taking your life in your hands, <laughs> potentially, but why was it an act of faith? Because I told you that, and Joseph uh, sent out the email and said to everyone, there's gonna be a talk, and Lachlan has mentioned it on the board, and yesterday and the, the mass before, and, and everyone believed, yeah, there will be a Catholic talk here, this morning at 11 a.m., and lo and behold, you turned up, and there was. So the natural basis of faith is that we actually always trust someone. It's always faith in a person. So that's a natural basis of faith. We do it with our friends all the time. We agree to meet them at a particular place. We're going to study together with them. We're going to go out for a meal. We're going to visit a family member, whatever. And we take it for granted that it's going to turn out as we've planned. In fact, when it doesn't work out that way, we call them up, we say, hey, what's happened? You know, I do this, do that. Oh, look, I was held up, I'm sorry, I didn't have a chance to call you. My phone went flat. There's some explanation. And when, in fact, somebody doesn't really have an explanation, that they just didn't care, then we naturally feel, or rightly feel hurt, because for them, our friendship didn't mean all that much. But, so that, you might say, is the natural basis of faith. But that is simply the basis for natural faith, not for theological faith. So the virtue of faith and of hope and of love all help us to know God in himself, in himself. Where do they first take place within us? They take place through the gift of baptism. And in the gift of baptism, they are what we call infused into us. The seal of baptism through water actually sets us apart as children of God through water and the Holy Spirit, right? I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The infusion, what that means, is like a seal. You know how a seal on the wax, and this is how St. Thomas Aquinas explains it, a seal is impressed upon the wax, the seal is taken off, but the impression remains behind. Well, God does something similar to the human soul, so that to God, the human soul that has been uh, baptized is actually different from the one that hasn't been baptized. And the one who has been baptized, God's love now directs itself to that person in a unique way. And this is why in that well-known conversation in St. John's Gospel, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he's telling him about a man being reborn of the Spirit, and Nicodemus thinks, you know, Jesus is talking about getting inside his mother's womb again. Do you remember that conversation? Okay, maybe, maybe not, but let me refresh your, your memory. So, you know, Nicodemus didn't understand it. And, you know, Jesus is talking in sometimes figurative language, and He's okay with sometimes being misunderstood as well. But he's really talking about baptism and the Holy Spirit that comes through baptism as a sign, as a sacrament. So the infusion of the gift of faith, of hope, and of love is something that makes its mark upon the soul. And now I want to just focus on what the gift of faith actually helps us to do and why it is necessary. Because living as children of God means living in this world, but at the same time communicating with a mystery that is invisible and is supernatural. 
which when we break up the two Latin words, super natura means above nature. So the act of being able to believe, to hope, and to love God is something that's actually naturally above or above our nature. So if you are able to believe in God, to hope in Him, to trust Him, and to actually love Him, you are doing something that as human beings you are not capable of by nature. It's because God has raised you to the position so that you could actually know Him and love Him and hope in Him. Let me give you an example of what I mean. It's in the dog's nature to bark, correct? Anyone disagree with that? Okay, thank God, no, there's no disagreement. But if a dog began to talk, we'd say, wow, this is an extraordinary dog. Now, we've heard of talking parrots, but I've never heard of a talking dog. So if a dog were talking, were to begin to talk, even just to say a few words, and if that's the only thing that it could do, I'll think, wow, your owner is incredibly patient with you, and you have somehow managed to get your bark into a, a you know, human word. So that's something above its nature. So too for us, to be able to believe in God, to hope in Him or to trust or to love Him, is above our nature. By nature, how far can we actually go? By nature, without the aid of grace, I'm going to get to that in a minute, because none of this would be possible without the grace of God. By nature, the furthest we could go is to have a natural desire for the infinite. We have a natural desire for infinite beauty, infinite goodness, infinite truth, infinite love. Because in this life, by nature, again, unaided by grace, we know there is truth and goodness and beauty and love. We understand particular concepts. But to go from that to then say, you know what, what would it be like to have infinite goodness, infinite beauty, infinite love? I don't know, but it'd be darn good. It'd be very beautiful to experience. And then to go from that, that's about as far as we could go by nature alone. It's through divine revelation, however, that we are able to go from there to say that this infinite love, this infinite goodness, infinite beauty, infinite power is actually there. And we can deduce this, by the way, through natural reasoning because the world as organized, the universe as systematic as it is, following impeccably the laws of mathematics, it's, it's just, it, this doesn't make sense unless there's someone, some enormous power behind it that actually is keeping it in existence and, and keeps it all in motion. Because within itself, the universe does not contain the reason for its own existence. And one time years ago now, probably coming close to 100 years ago, nearly maybe 90 years ago, there was a famous debate between Bertrand Russell and um, Frederick Copleston. Have any of you heard of Bertrand Russell? Famous mathematician. Oh gosh, your children of your time, so I heard of Bertrand Russell. But anyway, Bertrand Russell was a phenomenal mathematician, and I think he was a uh, professor at Cambridge University. Frederick Copleston, who also had the letters FR before his name, so he was, he was a priest, Father Frederick Copleston, was a phenomenal philosopher. And they had a great uh, debate amongst themselves. I don't know how many hundreds, if not thousands of people were there listening to this debate. And, and then Frederick Copleston at one point said to Bertrand Russell, he says, tell me the reason why the universe exists. Because he's coming from a philosophical bent. And Bertrand Russell really couldn't give him an answer. He says, the universe just is and we go from there. Hello. The universe just is, so it just fluked its place there. It just happened to come out of some ether, some liquid or whatever we call the Big Bang. If there's no origin behind it, there's no causality, the universe doesn't make sense. If that part of the universe doesn't make sense, then how is it that we can say all these other parts of the universe make sense? If you're going to have one part make sense, another one doesn't make sense, okay, it doesn't make sense to me right now, but we can figure it out. 
but don't tell me that part we just won't go there but we'll go to this part because it means now I am putting blinkers on in my intellectual inquiry so naturally we can only go so far in our inquiry to know the ultimate and it's only through grace that power from God that supernatural power from God that enable us to know things above our nature. That's a rough working definition of grace. That supernatural power from God, all power from God is supernatural, but we make that distinction because we say the power from God shown through the physical world is like a natural power, but supernatural power from God is an invisible power. It's beyond detection by empirical means. So scientists have developed amazing instruments to detect various particles and electromagnetic waves which have both particle and wave uh, or, or light uh, properties about them and but then there is another source of power that is completely invisible completely undetectable and that's what we call the power of grace the role of grace is to raise us up to do things above our nature so it's God's grace then that is able to somehow raise us to the ability to believe in the first place and to know him as personal you see the greek gods or the greek philosophers knew their gods and they could detect and work out through natural reason that gods or god existed and someone like aristotle could talk about the unmoved mover but to come from the point, even if you came to the understanding of having, there's one God, because otherwise, you have two gods, then they're not infinite, because you can't have two infinite beings. Right? That's the simple argument against the multiplicity of gods, even though people often do have multiple gods in their lives. But a true God has to be infinite. And if you're infinite in one area, you've got to be infinite in every area, or else you're not truly God. You're not the greatest Thing or being that could exist but to come to that understanding that this person that this God is actually a personal God that he's interested in me that he cares about me as the apple of his eye as if I were the only one precious to him that is the light of faith playing out that's the virtue of faith so now an important distinction we need to make the Latin or the medieval philosophers, or theologians, sorry, used to, to do this thing called the fides qua and the fides quae, by which they meant the faith in which I believe and the faith by which I believe. What do I mean? <clears throat> Every Sunday at Mass, or anyone who goes to a Christian church, mainstream Christian church, will do a thing called the profession of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, or if you have the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, the long creed, yes I know. Uh, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, and so forth. They are the things in which I believe that I believe have been revealed by God about himself. And I believe them because I know that God has revealed them to me. This is why I can actually believe. Because everything that, just as you believe that there's going to be a talk here, based on what? Based on human authority and the general experience that you've come to have so far that you could trust that when these announcements are made that it actually comes to pass wonderful but the reason why we believe in God's teachings is because God has, the, has been the one to reveal them and that God uh, only speaks the truth so God knows all things and God reveals the truth God knows all things. In other words, it means that God's knowledge does not develop like our knowledge grows. Whose knowledge today has grown from what it was yesterday or last week? 
should all have your hands up, otherwise you are brain dead. And, and that's not an insult, it happens whether you like it or not. Now, you forget certain things, true, but you do learn new things. We learn new things every day, even if it's just about the things that have happened that day. We may be prompt to forgive them, to forget them, not forgive them, we might need to forget some, forgive some things too, but we forget them, but our knowledge is constantly growing. And also we learn about the things that we hold most dear to us, we realize that sometimes we make mistakes. We formulate opinions constantly, opinions about friends, family members, teachers, opinions about politicians, opinions about issues of our day, whether they're politics or moral issues, or whatever it is, scientific discoveries. Oh yeah, that sounds very genuine, convincing. That one sounds like a hoax. This is something else, you know. Buying cars, which car, we form opinions. And one of the things that we come to learn through personal experience is that some of our opinions will be mistaken. And, they, and if we're open to learning new things, then we will grow in our understanding, we will correct our opinions and realize that I've made a mistake or I overlooked something. And as a result, my knowledge at the end is more complete than what it was before. Okay? Now, there's a necessary condition here that I have to be teachable, that I have to want to learn. How many of you have heard the expression, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still? You have? Okay. Oh, all right. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm impressed, you know. <laughs> all right. Probably what we hear more often than not is, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. It's the same idea. That shows, you see, if there's no openness to learn, forget it. Stop fooling yourself. Openness to learn means recognizing that there is still more to be learned about various things. And even one of the things that really touches me is when I look at the great minds in history, whether they're philosophers or scientists, mathematicians, sociologists, they're actually very humble in what they know. Because they realize they do know a lot, a huge amount, but there's more to be learned. Well, guess what? When it comes to God, God doesn't have this experience. He just knows everything from all eternity. So when God reveals something, God is just absolute. It's perfect, it's complete, it's unbounded, it's entire, it's whole, it's everything that it should be. And God, unlike us, doesn't think, you know what, <sighs> that earth now has been spinning around the sun for, you know, quite a few million years, I think I should spin it a bit faster, you know, I'd like to see how it goes, to see what it looks like, or, uh, you know, the way the sun, I think I should have made the sun, this our particular sun, a bit bigger, you know. God doesn't think like that. God, because we do. That's our knowledge progresses. So those things that have been revealed to us by God are revealed by Him about Himself. Things that we would never have been able to work out by our own natural light of reason. So all the scientific inquiry in the world would never have led to the teachings revealed to us in Christ. And what were the two big teachings? He's revealed lots of things to us, but that God is in fact three, not one. Well, he's one, one God, but he's three persons in one divine nature. We would never, ever have been able to work this out by the own natural light of reason. And that the second person of the Trinity has taken on human flesh through and revealed to us as the person of Jesus Christ, who has been raised from the dead and revealed to us a new light, a new life that each one of us is called to. And this life is lived, shared in through faith, through hope, and through love. So the doctrine of our faith are the things that have been revealed to us by God that we believe in. That's very good. Is that clear to everyone? Is there anyone who doesn't understand what I'm just saying there? Okay, next comes the point now where we actually have 
and need the virtue of faith. Because there are lots of people who can readily look at the Catholic creed and all the 12 articles that have been revealed there by God with absolute authority. And bear in mind that as human beings, we can know absolute truth. We actually can know absolute truth. But we cannot know truth absolutely. That's not just a, a twist or you know, a poetic turn of phrase. That's actually a very fundamental insight into human nature. We can know absolute truth. We can know things that are absolute and eternal. But we cannot know truth absolutely because we cannot know all truth, not in this life. And even in the next life, we will spend all eternity learning things about God, about each other, and knowing even that in heaven, when we will be completely happy, we will never actually know everything. In heaven we will know that. But knowing that will not make us sad. Darn it, I was looking forward to knowing everything and, and now I find out I can't. You know? That will not make us unhappy. In fact, it just makes us praise God more in His beauty, but also keeping on learning all eternity. So God has revealed these things, these absolute truths about our faith. But we can have a lot of people who know them and yet don't believe in them. And then you can have people who actually believe in God and His presence and that He is personal and close to them in their lives. But they have a very limited understanding of what the doctrine of the faith is all about. They know it in simple terms, but they believe. So what is this quality that enables us to actually believe in God and to rise to these truths? That is what the virtue, the theological virtue of faith is about. If you here today can believe in the things of God revealed by Him with conviction, that is because you have the virtue of faith. So this is the fides qua and the fides qua. The faith which I believe or in which I believe and the faith by which I believe. It's the virtue of faith that enables me to actually rise to these things. So when we look at that, how are we going for time? Okay, a few more minutes, good. Well, it might have turned, turned out to be a, a three uh, talk in the beginning, uh, after all. But anyway, that's fine. It's better that we go into detail so we can get a better grasp of what we're, um, what we're talking about. The What is the particular role? Because I said in the beginning, we often use the word faith, live by faith, as a generic term for all our life with God. But in fact, if we wanted to be more correct, we should say, I live by faith, by hope, and by love not just by faith. So if we use that term, fine, it's a bit too long, a bit of a mouthful to say, I live by faith, by hope, and by love. If we're saying that all the time, uh, it's just a mouthful, it just gets cumbersome and overbearing. So we just tend to say, I live by faith. But what we really mean is, by the three theological virtues, because I need each of them. And why are there three theological virtues? Because there are three parts of us, intellectually, that need to be directed towards God. Faith, the virtue of faith, tends, the medievalists say, it has a particular connection with our intellect, that power of the mind to know things, or the power of the soul, rather, to know things. The intellect is not the same as the brain. The brain is the physical organ that knows, or through which we know, the mind or the intellect is the power of the soul that enables the soul to know things. And the information comes to us through the senses, our five senses. The brain somehow extracts that information and presents information to the, make sense of it. And then the mind, which is the power of the soul, somehow extracts that information and understands it. 
So the mind is what's capable of joining dots in a way that the brain does not quite do so. And that's what distinguishes us so much from the animals. That's why we can actually study ourselves as well as studying animals. You don't see animals, well sometimes they'll study each other if uh, you know, they're, they're, having, they're preying on each other or uh, sometimes you see animals grooming each other and it's beautiful to see. But you don't see animals sitting aside, in a, stepping aside in a laboratory or having conversations about, now what do you think the other dolphins are thinking right now? You know, it's, it's just because they don't have that ability. And some say, oh, what makes you think that that's the case? I say, it's true. I don't see any evidence that animals study each other. So I can only go with what I know, not with what I do not know, because that's an argument from silence. So the virtue of faith then works particularly closely with the mind. The virtue of hope, they used to say, works very closely with the memory. So there's the natural memory, but there's also a spiritual memory that enables, uh, enables us to recognize spiritual realities and things that are immaterial. And then the virtue of love connects particularly with the role of the will, because that's what enables us. So if there were any other capacities in the soul that needed to be turned to God, then there would have been four or five theological virtues. Okay? And some say, oh, maybe there's got to be three theological virtues because there are three persons of the Trinity. I don't think so. It's because God gives the virtues in order to perfect the things within us that need to be perfected. So then the gift of faith, what actually happens in the dynamic of the gift of faith? Well, the gift of faith enables us to believe things which are unseen, invisible and to, to hold them with conviction. Normally, what happens? Normally, the way in which we know is the information, as I said a moment ago, comes to us through the senses. The mind extracts that information, recognizes, makes a judgment, recognizes there's something out there, makes a judgment about what it is. If it doesn't know what it is, it will ask the question. And then the mind will present certain things to the will. And the will, as I mentioned in the talk on conscience and morality, you might remember this, but anyway, if not, we'll have a refresher some stage. The mind is like the spiritual vacuum cleaner that takes in knowledge. The will is like a harpoon that goes out from the human person and seeks whatever it recognizes as good. So the mind presents to the will, our freedom, our free choice, our freedom is another reality, but anyway, we'll talk about that at another point. The, the mind presents to the will whatever it considers to be good, and then the will goes after it, with conviction. In the process of the act of faith, what's going on is the mind actually has no evidence to believe these things, because it doesn't have experience from the senses. I have never experienced in my senses the, the, the Blessed Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, and that the originator in the Trinity is the Father, and that the Son comes from Him eternally, and the Holy Spirit comes from both of them as from a single principle. I have no experience of that in this life. Maybe God might give me a vision, but anyway, that would be outside of the normal realm. I have never seen Jesus, but I know He is there, but I've had no personal experience of him. Now, so in the role of faith, the act of faith, what's going on is that the will is what's forcing the mind to rise up to these things, even though it cannot see them. Okay, so no worries. The noise will stop soon. The, so that's what's going on. It's the reverse order that's going on. The will is what's moving the mind to assent, to believe these things. Why? Because it's based on the role of God himself revealing. And God knows all things, and God can never deceive, nor be deceived. That's how, so it's actually the reverse order in which we know. Normally we know through the mind leads to the will, and then the will chooses. In this case, the will is what's forcing the mind to rise up and to say, 
I believe in these things. And we can believe with conviction. So in order to do that, obviously grace has to be present. Because the mind otherwise has absolutely no evidence to, to suggest to it or to convince it to rise to this point. And this is why then the role of theology is faith seeking understanding. Because now the mind is up here and it's assenting, it's appealing, it's believing in these things revealed by God. And it believes through faith because it has no evidence. But the role of theology is to say, okay, I'm believing these things here. What rational explanation can I give so that it makes sense to my human mind that these things are in fact as they have been revealed to me? So can you see how the role of the theologian is faith-seeking understanding, not understanding, reason-seeking faith? And the more that that virtue grows within me, the more my faith grows and the stronger it is. Make sense? Okay, I'll leave that for today. Any quick questions? We've got five minutes before the other class moves in. Don't worry, you feel free to save your questions for next week. But just remember that in mind, the role, the way the virtue of faith works is the opposite order to the way in which we normally know things. It's the will that's moving the mind to ascent. Thanks for listening. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, the world without end. Amen.